listening to PetLifeRadio.com. The Pet Doctor is brought to you by Dog.com. For everything and anything dog, shop Dog.com today for all the top brands. Greenies, Frontline, Kong, Nylabone, Royal Canin, and more. Shop at Dog.com and use the promo code SADDOC, S-A-D-D-O-C, and get $15 off your order of $75 or more. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinary media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. When is the best time to think about the end of your beloved pet's life? There never seems to be the right time, and you definitely don't want to wait until your pet is in severe, intractable pain. Dr. Julie Reck, a companion animal veterinarian in Charlotte, North Carolina, is all too familiar with a heartache pet owners experience while trying to grapple with the end-of-life decisions for the animals they love. Dr. Reck has written a very compassionate book on understanding our emotions, a pet's perception of death, and how to work through one of the most difficult and loving decisions a pet owner can ever make. We'll be right back after this short break. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. There's a movement afoot. Shoebuy.com. Join the millions of people who shop Shoebuy.com's over 400 brands and 500,000 products. Order now and get free shipping and free return shipping. Shoebuy.com, the world's greatest shoe store. Walk your dog in style and comfort. Enter the code DOCTOR, D-O-C-T-O-R, at checkout and get a 10% discount plus free shipping at Shoebuy.com. Love your pets but wish their medications were a lot less expensive? They are at 1-800-PET-MEDS. You'll not only save on flea and heartworm medications, but on prescriptions for arthritis, incontinence, thyroid, and more. And you get fast service, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Plus, our licensed pharmacists ensure accuracy, monitor drug interaction, and more. See why over 5 million people have trusted their pet's health to 1-800-PET-MEDS, America's largest pet pharmacy. Call now or order online. Go to PetMeds.com forward slash doctor, D-O-C-T-O-R, to get 10% off any order and free shipping on orders of $39 or more at PetMeds.com. FTD's network of over 40,000 florists around the world have been creating beautiful handcrafted arrangements for 100 years. Each arrangement is delivered the same day and backed by FTD's seven-day satisfaction guarantee. For a century, people have trusted their most important occasions to the flower experts at FTD. Since Pet Life Radio is all about puppy dogs and flowers, our listeners, that's you, can get a 20% discount on your order. Just go to florop.com and use the code DR20 at checkout. F-L-E-U-R-O-P dot com, code word D-O-C-T-O-R and the number 20. Hi, this is Marcy Davis and my service dog, Whistle, and we're your hosts of Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Working Like Dogs is the show where you can learn everything you ever wanted to know about working animals or working dogs. Whether you're a member of a working dog team or you've just seen a working dog or animal out at the mall or the grocery store and you're curious about how these amazing animals work with their human partners, then Working Like Dogs is the show for you. Join us for the inside scoop at Working Like Dogs on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in and we'll see you now. 
Dr. Reck, what made you think of writing a book like this, which is so absolutely essential? I run into this situation all too often at my practice. Absolutely. Well, Bernadine, I have been um, helping my community with an in-home euthanasia service. And so I had gotten, you know, very familiar with these phone calls and talking to people on a daily basis. And, you know, we all expect as a veterinarian, both for my personal pets and for my patients, that saying goodbye is going to be just very, very difficult. But what I was really surprised at and, um, you know, what I wanted to help people with was that they were really struggling with um, the ultimate decision. And even though logically they knew that this was the best option for the pet, they just really were having a hard time, you know, coming to grips and um, and being okay with it. Um, and as a veterinarian, even though, I mean, I love my personal pets deeply, I just know that because of my education and experience with the euthanasia procedure that, you know, the actual decision-making will be a little bit easier for me. So I wanted to provide clients, you know, and pet owners, the most best option for getting this information to be comfortable with what euthanasia is and how to work through that decision at their own pace and at their own comfort level um, and in the privacy of their home through working through the book and the worksheets that I provide in the book. So that was my inspiration in, in wanting to help people with that. I think a lot of people would be surprised to know that there are veterinarians who have an in-home euthanasia service most people would say okay you know my i need to let my pet pass so i'm going to take it to my veterinarian and have it done there why at home well that's a really good question after i had been in practice for a couple years it was something that more and more and more people were coming in and wanting and a lot, a lot of times what was driving that was they had a pet that either was very very large or um, maybe had severe arthritis or had a very painful disease so that when they had to be picked up to be transported, the pen actually got very, very uncomfortable and anxious from that pain. And, um, you know, these clients were just really, really concerned about the pet feeling that way in their, in their last moments and on their last day at all. So uh, after seeing, you know, and understanding that this request was being made a lot, we were a very busy practice right in the center of the city. And even though a lot of the doctors wanted to provide this, we just couldn't afford to have a doctor leave the floor and and risk not being prepared for an emergency. So once I hit a point in my career that I could provide this to people, I wanted to, to go ahead and set up an option that was available to any pet parent in my community who wanted to, you know, have just a peaceful goodbye with the pet in the comfort of their home. And it's, you know, gotten really, really good feedback over this last year in the Charlotte area. I think probably another reason why people will opt for this, because we are now having probably three to four veterinarians in my portion of Southern California who are providing a service such as yours for in-home youth in Asia, where some of the pets, they just come around the corner in the car to my hospital and it's like, "Uh uh-oh. I know where we're going, so they will get stressed. And I think oftentimes, as you're saying, people want to have just that peace, that ease, the stressless as possible, being at home with that pet. Absolutely. A lot of times when they've gone through, you know, a chronic disease, they've had a lot of diagnostic testing, and even when they've had the most compassionate, you know, vet staff who's always tried to be, you know, calm with them in the hospital, they can still get overwhelmed. And and the clients, too, there's a lot of privacy that the home option offers. And to my surprise, after doing this service for the last year, I have you know, learned that there's an additional benefit to doing it at home. And that's actually for the pets that are remaining in the family. Um, When I was, you know, doing these euthanasias in the clinic, it would be normal for me to get a return phone call about once a month from a client that had lost their pet in the hospital. And what they were noticing is that, you know, the dogs or cats that they still had were seemed anxious or were searching for the other pet or just really were having a hard time adjusting to the fact that that pet was no longer there. And they were looking for advice on getting another pet or what they can do to help. Um, But since doing this in a home environment, I now encourage and, you know, want families to go ahead and allow the other pets to have access to, to us while we're performing the procedure and they get a few minutes with the other pets afterwards 
and it really gives them the closure that they need to go ahead and restructure their pack formation or just, you know, move on with, with being a part of the family. I totally concur with you, Dr. Rick, because there are many times when I know that a family has had just this wonderful pack relationship, cats and dogs, they all get along super well, and one of them, when it needs to pass on, it leaves that void in the pack, and animals do understand when a pet is no longer there, when that pet dies. So I'll sometimes recommend if they're unable or they don't want to do a euthanasia at home to bring those pets in with them to the practice, especially if they want to be present. And sometimes even if the owners don't want to be present, we'll allow those pets, the remaining pets, to have access to the deceased pet so they can sniff it, look at it, touch it. And I think it does help them. Would you agree? I would completely agree. After, you know, this experience of, over this year, um, I'm, I'm convinced um, that, that that really does help. Many people, when they think of euthanasia, will think about capital punishment in our human population. And the controversy that goes on, you'll hear about it being inhumane and it being painful I think people are very surprised when they come in and see these euthanasias that they are so quick, so painless, so dignified. Could you go ahead and explain what you go through, how you prepare the pet and the person for this passing? Absolutely. And 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 I totally agree. I actually talk about this in the book about how there is a difference between what we're doing but um, what it go ahead and start with it. Uh, I have a phone call with the owner beforehand where we talk about what's going to happen. So over the phone, we've gone through the process so that they're a little bit more comfortable when I get into the home. And once I arrive in the home, we all spend a few minutes just making sure that the pet is settled with me and everybody's comfortable. But the first step of my process is I actually like to administer an injection under the skin of sedation that also has pain medication in it. And it really allows the pet to very gracefully and just nice and progressively um, get into a very relaxed state. They'll a lot of times just go ahead and fall asleep and maybe begin snoring or be more comfortable than that pet parent has seen in a really long time. A lot of times they don't even know that they've got the injection because they'll be so focused on their loving family that's surrounding them or we'll be giving them some treats. So, at, you know, when we do that, they almost don't even realize that a procedure or anything has even been given to them. Once the pet has reached that state with the sedation that they're really relaxed and comfortable is when we'll go ahead and give the final um, medication that we use commonly for euthanasia, and the best way to describe it is just a very large dose of anesthesia, and that can be given to the pet, and again, they just go ahead and just really gracefully pass away, and there's never any anxiety or any fear or any worry in that pet, and for me, when I started the service, you know, I wanted to dedicate myself to it not only being a physically humane process, but a mentally and emotionally humane process for that pet. What has been so marvelous in the euthanasias that I've been able to provide for the pet owner is when they'll say afterwards, is it done? That's so quick. They're so much at peace. They're relaxed that they're amazed at how peaceful and how, just as you're saying, how painless this whole procedure is. I think there are so many times distraught themselves that this is going to hurt the animal. As you're saying, it doesn't hurt them. That pain medication is a a marvelous way of making sure that they're just passing with that dignity. Absolutely. And I totally agree. One of the biggest compliments a pet owner can give me is to say afterwards, wow, that that's, if I could choose you know, when I have to leave this world, if I could choose for it to be like that, uh, that would be such a blessing. And that's really when I know I have done my job to my fullest capabilities. Um, so I totally agree. You mentioned that you have a book, Facing Farewell, and you have some worksheets in there. How do you get somebody to the point where, and as I say in the introduction, you never want to think about euthanasia when you're distraught, when your pet is terribly ill 
and all of a sudden, this is when you think about it. When do you recommend people start thinking about the euthanasia process? Well, surprisingly, I actually recommend that that all pet parents think about it, and I agree with you. I think that we can make the best decisions and have the best mindset when we haven't just gotten a terrible diagnosis or there hasn't been a terribly traumatic injury or car accident. So, you know, when we have a pet, we know that this is going to be part of the responsibility of the of ownership. And going ahead and just getting uh, some basic knowledge about this, um, basic understanding of how it works, how you're going to work through the decision can be so important. So really, I'm recommending it for a pet owner of any age pet because we don't know when things are going to happen. And, you know, it's always best to be prepared. And I absolutely agree with you because one of the things I've done for myself, I'm still in good health and I hope I have many more years ahead of me, but I decided to go ahead and have all my fuel arrangements taken care of and the will and the trust and all those other things. And it just allows me to sleep much more comfortably when I bring these subjects up with my daughters. Oh, mom, I don't want to talk about it going Look, it's going to happen at some time. So when you get that puppy, that kitten, when it's a middle-aged animal and still in good health, think about this. And what just makes me so distraught when I have a client whose pet really is not doing well and they say, I want to let it pass naturally, trying to convince them that natural isn't always best. How do you discuss this, Dr. Rick? How do you work them through that portion of it? Do you have a worksheet for it? Well, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I think is really, really important, and I started my book out with this, is understanding that humans and animals have different perspectives on living and dying. For us, we have, you know, if you ask anybody how long they want to live, a lot of times we'd say forever. You know, we don't really want to go. We have a lot to, to look forward to. There's always something to achieve. There's always a family event that we want to be a part of. You look through our culture, we're fascinated with the concepts of immortality and, you know, all the vampire things that are, that are brewing now in and, and TV and movies. Um, but, you know, our animals really see life in a different fashion. It's not a straight line for them. It's a circle. And, you know, we can learn a lot by watching how they age gracefully, and it's just okay with things changing and their body changing. And I think it's really important for, for us to understand. And I use a couple examples that I've actually witnessed during home farewells and, and, and how animals respond to, you know, either the dying of a housemate or, you know, growing old. Um, that can really just help us remember that they in no way, shape, or form want to be here forever. And really when, when they have lost you know, almost all their normal abilities to, you know, get around, to be a part of the family, to just enjoy the day-to-day activities. I really don't think that they, you know, want to endure, you know, life-prolonging procedures or medications just to be here and breathing. So I really try to explain to them that aspect of it. And I also just remind them that when we are thinking about euthanasia, we're not trying to time it for the day that the pet would normally pass away. We're trying to give them the gift of not letting them endure that. And so sometimes explaining it in that fashion and helping them realize that it's different than choosing this option for human family, it seems to kind of lift the burden of the decision a little bit for them. And, you know, I like to, I added a couple worksheets in Facing Farewell just to help you know, understand how they feel themselves about living and dying, and that way we don't inflect our own fears and emotions onto what our pet is experiencing. We're chatting right now with Dr. Julie Reck, who has written a marvelous book called Facing Farewell. So we're going to take a short little farewell to listen to a commercial. We'll be right back. And Dr. Julie, I want you to go through this worksheet that you have, one of your worksheets, and trying to help people make just a very difficult decision but a very loving decision. We'll be right back after the short break. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. At Petco, we really love 
pets. There isn't anything we won't do to make sure they're getting the best products and the best care. So when you ask us a question like, So how do you feel about cat condos? We can say from experience, Feels like home. For her. Enter the code DOCTOR10. D-O-C-T-O-R, the number 10, and get 10% off any order. No minimum at Petco.com. Hello? Danica, where have you been? Oh, Graham, I've been busy, you know, racing, GoDaddy girl. Oh, I built my own online store with GoDaddy. Really? Let me see. Grandma'sAuction.com? Hey, those grandpa's golf clubs. Grandma needs her bingo money. Use promo code Dr. 10, D O C T O R, the number 10, and get a dot com domain name for just $7.49 at GoDaddy.com. If you ask the question, what do I want? Love My Pets, the new single by Mark Winter, available on iTunes. Greetings, human. What planet am I on? Welcome to Pet Planet. Here's a copy of Pet Planet Magazine, Florida's most informative and fun pet resource magazine. It features heartwarming stories and informative articles from local and national pet experts. Excellent. Pet Planet Magazine offers Operation Planet Rescue, helping rescued pets find new homes. And it's available at 500 locations in South and Central Florida and 24-7 on the Internet at PetPlanetMagazine.com. If you're out and about with your pet, you may be featured in paparazzi, candid pictures of you and your pet. For up-to-date pet-friendly events, activities, and pet-related services and products, Pet Planet Magazine is your final destination. I shall take this magazine home with me. Back to your home planet? No, to my condo in Boca. Pet Planet Magazine. Check them out at www.petplanetmagazine.com or 352-394-8578. It's out of this world. Welcome to Sassy Seniors, a show about our fabulous older dogs and cats. I'm your host, Kelly Jackson. You know, I wanted to create a show to really showcase our senior pets. And you know, as the human population ages and lives longer, of course, so are our wonderful pets. But many of us with aging pets, it's so interesting. We have a tough time realizing or really admitting that they are seniors. So in a way, I'd kind of like to think of our senior pets as, as wise puppies. What do you think about that? Be sure to join us for another dish of Sassy Seniors. And remember, celebrate your senior pets. Every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On PetLife Radio. PetLife Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to The Pet Doctor on PetLife Radio with Dr. Bernadine Cruz. The doctor is in, and we'll see you now. We're speaking right now with Dr. Julie Reck. And Dr. Julie, this book of yours, I'm hoping people are going to, you know, they pick up the book on how to raise the puppy, how to raise the kitten. I think this is, it might be a bit of a different book for somebody to give a pet owner as a gift, but I think it would be a marvelous gift to give any pet owner that we know. Tell me one of the ways that you work people through on this quality of life because that is so difficult sometimes as I'm chatting with my clients and they're saying, well, you know, it, it's still eating and it still wags its tail and the cat is still purring and trying to describe to them quality of life. How do you go through that? How do you touch on that? 
Well, again, I do believe that information and knowledge is very powerful. So um, I've made sure that in a really easy to understand format, I've gone through the symptoms of pain that you can recognize as a pet owner in dogs. And then I talk about it separately in cats so that they understand that, you know, believe it or not, a certain type of fur in a cat can actually not mean joy, satisfaction, but actually mean discomfort. So, you know, giving them that knowledge can be very helpful. And then as I work through um, explaining how to understand quality of life, one of the things I really encourage people to do is actually research whatever your pet's illness or condition. Um, make sure you go and research what's called the human experience of that disease. One time I uh, received a phone call from someone who was interested in uh, a home farewell for their pet in Charlotte, and she had a cat that had osteosarcoma. And the cat had been diagnosed by her veterinarian about um, six months ago. And that was kind of the timeline that her vet had given her, that he expected the cat to have six to eight months left, and that she would probably know that it was time if the cat stopped eating or had a significant limp. And what she had noticed the night before she called me was that the cat, um, that was the first time the cat had refused a meal and also didn't eat very well at breakfast that morning. And And osteosarcoma, for those that are listening, is bone cancer. And it's a little bit rare in cats. We see it more in dogs, but it still can happen. And she was very conflicted because she had noticed the symptom of the cat not eating, but the cat seemed to very much enjoy being petted, was still purring, and just overall otherwise and seemed comfortable when it was laying down. And when I was explaining to her, she was also a a worker in the human medical field, and I was explaining to her osteosarcoma and, you know, more about that, and also that I have humans who have, you know, been suffering from this. And the human experience is that it's really one of the most painful cancers that you can have. And even our strongest medications for pain don't control it. And once I said that, it really just, she just kind of took a deep breath and just really, it really helped her. Um, So that's one of the most important things I think a pet owner can do to understand quality of life is, you know, we're all mammals, all have the same organs, the same types of diseases can happen. So there's very few things that happen to pets that don't really happen to people. So it's, it can definitely be a good idea to fully understand how a human experiences that disease. And therefore you can um, kind of help determine the quality of life of that pet. One of the hardest things I think for people to understand is pain perception in pets. They're wired basically the same way that people are. I believe they're much more stoic. And one of the easiest ways for me to describe this is, okay, your dog or cat comes in to be neutered and gets spayed or castrated, and it typically goes home that same day wagging its tail. You know, maybe not as quick a wag in that tail, and they go, yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. And then you say, well, have you ever known a man who's had a vasectomy or a woman who's, you know, had an ovary hysterectomy? And they go, oh, yeah. I said, well, it's the same procedure. It's like, oh, didn't think about that one. So how do you, you're talking a little bit about pain perception and kitties purring. And yes, I tell people that purr is almost like a person meditating and having that, um, you know, trying to get into a different space in their mind. How do you address the pain and also how do you address passing naturally? People oftentimes want their pet just to pass naturally. Well, I think it's important when when people do have that mindset or just do hope that, you know, things happen on their own, you know, especially when we're dealing with conditions that involve um, heart issues or respiration issues, um, whether that be cancer or failure of those organs, um, it, it can definitely be scary and painful those last moments for your pet. And I think being honest and the position that we are as veterinarians, we do get to see life and death from beginning to end. We get to see diseases from beginning to end. And so it's important for us as professionals to be honest about what we have seen and what that pet will go through. And a lot of times people really appreciate your honesty. They have from me and uh, it it can better help them make that decision and maybe not be so um, concerned about making the decision of euthanasia, being comfortable with the idea that we don't have to let that pet 
pass away like that. Um, and I also tell people that one of the most common things, you know, when, when people do choose that option, it's extremely common that they regret that decision in the future. And so also imparting what other people have experienced can be helpful for that. As far as experiencing pain, I feel it's just really important that they understand how pets express pain and that it's different. They are going to actually try to hide that at all costs because that's their instincts. Out in nature, out in the wild, you know, if they express illness or discomfort, they're going to be banned or injured by other animals or not part of their pack anymore. So they're going to try to hide that. So I really go through um, and teach owners how to look for the subtle cues to understand um, that their pet is uncomfortable and how to be comfortable with that. What are some of the cues they should look for? Well, in dogs, and I like to go through them differently because dogs and cats um, do express them in completely individual ways. With dogs, one of the things that uh, I like people to look at is actually the dog's eyes. When a dog is painful, his um, pupil or that center black part of the eye will actually be wider than normal. And normally, the functioning of the pupil is to allow light in or restrict light from entering the eye if they're in a bright environment. So in a normal room in your house that has a fairly bright window, the dog's pupil or the black part should be fairly small. If it's getting larger, then we, we understand that there's something else causing that. So a lot of times paying attention to that can be very, very helpful. Also, you know, how is the dog, I'd go through how to find the heart rate and to measure that, and that can be a very simple way to measure it, how they're breathing, how they're limping, and also just how to feel, go up and down and feel their pet and um, what what your pet should normally be able to tolerate as far as palpating and experiencing a light pressure touch. Um, And, you know, when, when you're giving that, if they start to react, that's an indication that they're painful in that area. And for cats, again, one of the important cues is that very low, consistent purr. Um, A lot of times they'll have their head, um, they'll be laying down with all their legs tucked under their body and their head will actually be kind of perpendicular to the ground or the surface that they're laying on. And uh, that could be from actually experiencing uh, facial or head pain or just overall just trying to, um, you know, get themselves mentally somewhere um, where they can just kind of block out this discomfort. But those are and so many issues. times these pets just become reclusive. They just don't want to be with us anymore. They're hiding in the closet. They're under the bed. They're in a corner. Changes in their behavior. You know, typically you'd come home from work and they'll be the first one there at the door. And now it's like, mm, no, thank you. I think I'm just going to stay here in this corner. Absolutely. A behavior change can be one of the first indicators that they're uncomfortable. And we're so fortunate there are very safe and effective pain medications. But as you mentioned, there are some pains such as bone cancer that even in people, that medication just doesn't work on. I remember when I was in veterinary school and we were talking about levels of anesthesia. If you were doing surgery on a bone, that you'd need to make these animals at a much deeper plane of anesthesia. They were under much more because working on bones was so painful. I had the same experience and the same um, things taught to me about that in the classroom setting. And, you know, we are fortunate. We have a lot of medications, especially for dogs, to help them through arthritis and that kind of thing. When you have children in the home, this is a whole nother situation where people become very concerned. They have a child and they, maybe this was the first born child, so to speak, the pet that's in the home. And now the pet needs to be euthanized. And people, parents can be so distraught as to how do I explain this to a child? Should I just take it to the veterinarian and say that it didn't come home? Or I remember as a child, I had many a cat that went to the dairy and never to be seen again. How does your book, how do you help people work through what do you say to a child? Once they're at a certain age where they actually can understand being here or not being here and being in heaven and passing on, I think it's important that we try to tell the truth as much as possible. And, you know, you don't have to necessarily 
you know, for a very young child go through the details, but you can explain that, you know, the puppy is sick or old now and it's time for him to go to have and it's time for him to go move on and he's going to get, you know, brand new body and he's going to be comfortable again and he's going to be, you know, watching over you and explain it from that standpoint. Um, and a lot of times, I would say, you know, the age limit that um, people and parents opt to let their children be part of the home euthanasia is about six or seven years old. At that point, they can actually benefit from seeing the process. It is so peaceful, as you and I have talked about already, um, that there's that there is very little fear for the child. They handle it very well, and I think that when I've talked to these parents later on, they're very surprised that 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 memory is is sealed in so well that they that their child really understood that that pet's gone. They've gone to heaven, and it was for the best option for the pet and that they're most comfortable where they are now. And I've been surprised that even a child that's six or seven years old can really handle it and process and remember it that well. I totally agree with you. And one of the things that I will sometimes recommend, especially when there's these younger children in the family, children love the movie Lion King. And the first Lion King when the daddy lion is killed trying to save the child, that it's a circle of life and they understand circle of life. And I think it makes it much less scary for them. And the other thing that seems to help children as well as adults is having some type of ceremony afterwards. Do you go into ceremonies in your book? I actually, I don't go into that because I really just try to focus on helping through the decision-making process. And I wanted to make sure that you know, when someone picked up the book, it would have, you know, very concise information. People oftentimes, you know, will be getting this book once they have gotten bad news, and I wanted it to be something that they could go through very quickly and, and help them with the decision. But I totally agree with you. I think that going ahead and, and one of the things I do talk about is going ahead and making decisions for your pet afterwards ahead of time you know, decide what kind of cremation option or if you wanted a burial option. And if you do want a service, there are a lot of pastors and churches that are now offering that uh, for families to help them through this. And a lot of veterinary clinics offer um, yearly memorial services for all the pets that they have lost in the clinic. And it can be really good to incorporate the children in that. And one of the things people have to realize, no matter what age they are, that it is okay to grieve when you've lost a pet. You know, they become a part of our family. And sometimes people who don't have pets, who've never had that relationship, will look at you going, you're crying over a dead iguana? It's just a stupid iguana. But to you, it really was a part of the family and a part of your life. And everybody gets over this loss at a different rate. And sometimes it may take you a year or so. Sometimes it may be very quick. I always try to make sure that people realize it's not appropriate for them to say that, oh, you know what, well, just go out and get another one. It's like the analogy of you just lost a spouse. Well, just go out and get another husband. No, that's not how it works. And it certainly is okay, and it's a healthy process for people to grieve and go ahead and remember that pet. Um, and a lot of times, you know, I'll have people, and they're just not sure if they can ever go through this again and experience this loss. But I try to uh, help them remember everything that that pet has given them in the years that they've had. You know, we're, we're never going to be satisfied. We, if we could all choose, we would have them be life partners for us, I think. I, I know I would. <laughs> and... But just remembering the joy and the happiness that that pet brought when they are ready and when they have gone through and worked through that grieving process, I encourage them to find a pet. It's not going to be a replacement, but it's going to be a new addition that's going to bring new life to the family and new forms of joy. So I totally agree. Probably one of the most touching ceremonies I ever saw was a husband and wife. It was an older Rottweiler, and this little honey had had a marvelous life, but definitely needed to pass. So at my hospital, we have an outside area that's our little tranquility garden. We're outside, and the gentleman brought along an empty 
canning jar, a ball jar. And I'm just kind of watching going, this is interesting. I've never had anyone show up with a ball jar before. Couldn't understand. And right when the pet was taking its last few breaths, it opened up the jar, scooped it over the pet, put the cap back on again. He says, when I get my new dog, I'm going to open it up and I'm going to sprinkle this all over the dog. And when they did get a pet, they did this. And he says, you know, I think that Sadie, that was the old dog, has just given this little honey that little bit of extra oomph and that spice to make it a part of our family. I thought, oh, how different, how wonderful. Wow, that is that is just an amazing story. And what an amazing concept um, to do that and to help keep that memory of their former dog, you know, alive. And that's something that when I do have people that are concerned or not sure if they can go through this again, you know, I'll, I'll explain to them that, you know, taking on another pet, another pet that needs a home, another pet that can benefit from all the love that you've provided, what better way to honor the memory of the pet you've just lost than to continue providing that to another animal. What a touching story, though. If somebody wants your book to read it now before they need it, the name of it and where can they find it? Sure. It's called Facing Farewell, A Guide to Making End-of-Life Decisions for Your Pet. And it's available on its own website, which is facingfarewell.com. It's also on amazon.com. And some veterinary clinics are actually starting to carry it. And it can be really a beneficial communication tool between that veterinarian and that client as they're you know, working through the decision-making process. But if they're not carrying it right now, feel free to have them come to the website. We have a section that's just for veterinarians and um, we'll happily send them a free copy so they can evaluate it and see if it's a good information source for their clients. Well, Dr. Julie Reck, thank you so much for being with us today. This is information that pet owners sometimes prefer not to think about because, as you said, we want to keep these babies with us for as long as possible. Forever would be great, but that's not reality. And the reality of your book is it can be extremely helpful thinking about these end-of-life decisions when you're calm, you're not emotional, and your pet is healthy and sitting right by you wagging its tail and purring on your lap. Thank you so much for having me. It's been my pleasure, and if anyone is looking for this book, it's Facing Farewell. You've been listening to Dr. Bernadine Cruz on The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you, Mark Winter, our producer, for putting together these marvelous shows. Please tune in again next week when we'll have more information on how you can be the best pet owner possible. Thanks for listening. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs>